recording the session now, and it's October 11th. It's 1 p.m. Pacific time, and we're on with Dan Daggett for the Savory Champions exclusive session on Dan's work. Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, good. Yeah, good to be here. And um, so uh, this, this should be fun, I hope. So there, uh, we'll start off, I guess. This, this is a this is a photo that some friends gave to me. I didn't even know they had it a while back of me being in a demonstration uh, uh, to dump James Watt, Secretary of the Interior for Ronald Reagan back in the, my eco-radical days. Uh, so uh, I think this, I don't know, now it doesn't look like it. I was gonna say Lake Powell, but it's probably up around Flagstaff somewhere. So uh, yeah, I was part of the uh, Cattle Free in 93 movement. And one of the things, you know, we want to save the planet. Uh, this was uh, prior, climate change wasn't so, such a big deal at that point, but everything else was. And so we figured that, the, you know, one of the things we had to do is uh, get them off and lock it up. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, hmm, well, wait a minute. There it goes. Now, uh, but I ended, things changed, and I, when they changed, uh, it caused me to write a couple of books about this. One was called Beyond the Rangeland Conflict. Uh, that was the first book I wrote. It was nominated uh, for a Pulitzer Prize, didn't win one, but it was about working together with ranchers. So how did a eco-radical, uh, the top eco-radicals in the U.S., get around to wanting to work with ranchers instead of get them off and lock it up? Well, uh, actually, it, it, we can go back to the Sierra Club for that. To their mag, they're still working on it. Uh, this was in a recent article in Sierra Magazine, and it was not just about grazing, but about Alan Savory's holistic management as a way to make uh, say, uh, grazing uh, more ecologically well, uh, valuable, functional, uh, invaluable. I mean, you know, indispensable. It, it, it made it an essential part of of actual humans living and functioning on the planet and so this is taking issue with that the one of the statements well this was on the headline says alan savory he says putting more cattle onto the land can increase vegetation and remedy climate change just one problem the science doesn't add up so uh, how did i a sierra clubber end up uh, thinking that it does add up well when i i actually if we ended up I was involved in predator issues, and the predator issues got so oh, contentious that uh, some of the ranchers uh, wanted to have a get together, a meeting, and uh, those ranchers were ranchers who, and people in the ranching community who were aware of uh, uh, Alan's uh, holistic management uh, efforts and had been, you know, talking about working together. So we had a meeting where we all got together and a, a, a person who uh, was from the ranching community but had been involved in uh, conflict resolution said, well, you know, we're all gonna talk about what we want. What all do we want? And I was sitting there, you know, uh, all you know, uh, confrontative up and all that stuff. But the thing that really surprised me is a lot of the things I had in mind that I wanted to achieve by getting the cattle off and stopping all management, including savory management on ranches, all, all of a sudden there were ranchers there who were beating me to it, who were saying, who were expressing my goals before I had a chance to. Well, this this uh, sort of uh, piqued my imagination, my curiosity. And so we actually started meeting together again. Uh, and we called ourselves the six, six group or six of uh, us and six of them or six of one half a dozen of the other because we found out that we weren't really all that different, which was a surprise to, at least to me, I actually don't think it was quite a big, as big a surprise to the ranchers. But anyway, so we started going out and, and visiting places uh, where these methods that we were hearing about that supposedly would achieve our environmentalist goals were being applied. And one of the places we went to was near where I live here in Arizona. It was a, a, a big copper mine with a tailings pile that was 300 feet high and a thousand acres huge down near Globe, Arizona. And what we saw down there is where what you have just seen on the screen had actually happened, where a, a fellow had got the idea from Savory and even being to Africa, Terry Wheeler. And uh, he had decided to try to uh, 
see if uh, putting using cows would uh, actually get stuff to grow on those sterilized, chemically sterilized mine tailings. And well, you see how well it worked. It worked extreme. Well, it was the only thing that really worked. And uh, this photo here, the photo of the cows on there was taken a few years after the restoration had been achieved. And I go down, well, I was down there once this year with a fellow from Australia, and he was curious about it too. Uh, Tony Lavelle was his name. Uh, he wanted to see if it had worked, if it was still working. And lo and behold, there were the cows and there was the grass. So another place we, uh, uh, I visited while I was doing research for my first book about ranchers and enviros working together was in Nevada, near Austin, Nevada, about in the center of the state. And this is a picture of the before. When I got there, the after has hap uh, happened. And we're talking about, you know, scientists having stuff to add up. Well, this, I was adding this up. This is a, a, a picture of a, a copper mine up there, part of a copper mine. Actually, the front part of the uh, dam that held water to use in the mine. And it had been re restored with uh, the, uh, the standard of uh, procedures of using tractors and stuff to plant seeds with a seed drill and then waiting for it all to grow. And you can see there on the left how well it is grown. On the right, you can see where the Tiptons had actually started, Tony and Jerry, had started uh, their restoration method, uh, the animal impact. Uh, savory inspired uh, using cows to get stuff to grow. So they're, they're spreading, they've already spread seeds on it. I, I believe it was with an airplane as I recollect. And they were spreading uh, the hay. Uh, there's Jerry going up, uh, climbing it was steep. Uh, there's the cows, the hay spread. Here it shows them, you can see, barely see the wagon on top of the dam there. And they're spreading, and well, and lo and behold, the, the uh, well, <laughs> that was a pretty quick west rest restoration actually it was the fade on my powerpoint presentation but it uh there you get to see you know, the results eight months later as i understand it it rained significantly but not hugely that year and uh, those are the plants that grew and off to the right there is a picture of uh tony uh, uh standing in uh grass that was uh at the end of the growing season in one year from the restoration so um let's see Thing. Uh, there. Huh, that's an odd thing. Well, another thing that we did was we went to look at different places that had been managed in these two ways. And one of the things we ended up taking a look at were uh, preserves. This is a preserve in southern Arizona, very near the uh, Mexican border. And there's a group of ranchers and enviros and scientists and all sorts of folks. Uh, uh, taking a look at this preserve, it's kind of interesting. The fellow uh, who was hosting us on the preserve had uh, handed me a sheet of paper saying that it proves that everything I had been saying about uh, ranchers actually getting good results and doing better than the preserve was was wrong. So somebody said, well, we don't have to look at papers. Let's go look at the ranch. So we uh, went across the fence, and this photo was taken on the same day. It was a ranch uh, managed by Rook and Jelk holistically inspired by the savory holistic management. And there's the comparison. Uh, there's the, the one and uh, the grass oh, looks like maybe I was right. It looks a little taller on the ranch, doesn't it? And it does. So what this inspired us to do is uh, here was our six, six group. We got together with ranchers and started talking about how we could improve, uh, well, the rangelands of the West where we live. And this is Dennis Maroney on a ranch down by Prescott, Arizona, with the 6-6 the six, six group getting together and talking. There's enviros, ranchers, and uh, you name it there. So there we went down. We actually went out onto the land and uh, took our papers with us and did monitoring. And and uh, we checked preserved land and ranch land. This is down by Roosevelt Lake. You can see that in the background. And a number of enviros there, as well as uh, obviously some ranchers. And uh, just, well, you know, folks there who are really still involved, very involved in environmental groups in this area. Another thing we got the idea to do was why don't we use these practices to go out and, well, fix land that's in bad shape, like we saw at the mine sites. There's other places too. And this is us getting together up by Flagstaff at the beginning of one of those uh, 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 projects. 
this is a project that the 6-6 group got together and a group that we actually formed later called Eco Results got together to, uh, you know, get results uh, and use the animals to do it. This is a, a we think was an old uh, um, covered wagon train road uh, down near the Verde River, uh, kind of, well, in the countryside near Prescott, Arizona, actually near a town, a small town called Paulson, where we decided we were going to use uh, the, the, the animal impact process uh, to heal this. And we were wondering, can seeds, hay and cows, is how I shorthanded the project, repair this kind of erosion? So uh, let's take a look. Let's put, the, there's Norm Lowe, my partner in Eco Results. We've already got the hay down and he's spreading seeds. And there came, you saw the cows there, and I can't back this up. I haven't figured out how to use it all that well, but you saw that this is, uh, there's the before and there was the results you're seeing. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, it so surprised me that those results were so outrageous. I, I went back and actually checked the date and they're almost to the day, uh, uh, one year after the before photo there. And as our a cow commentator saying, it's not bad results. We did a number of projects. Here's another one on another ranch uh, in the Verde Valley, another eroded area. And as I say on here, you know what's next. Um, well, what is next? There's Norm again. I, I took a good photo of him there, so I just used it again. But we did the same proce procedure here. And we put down, there's the uh, George Yard, the rancher, his, his truck and spreading hay. And this is the result a few years after we did the process. But the one thing that's interesting here, you see the before, but over to the left, you can see an eroded uh, area. And that is a forest service restoration that it happened about a year before I took these photos. And uh, you can see how well that worked. They had spent uh, a good chunk of a million dollars hauling uh, more than a hundred truckloads of rock and dirt, mainly rock, they had plenty of dirt down in there. They spread seeds, they put on mulch and everything. And uh, I got a call from one of the Forest Service people who says, well, we fixed the erosion in that gut, in that area down there on the, the banana pasture that was shaped like a banana. So we went down and he said, you got to come down and look at it. I was in Montana at the time, but I said, I'll go look as soon as I get home. I went and looked and lo and behold, it had already washed out. They had one, it was a notable, but not a really uh, outrageous rainfall event that had just taken and uh, removed rocks, dirt and mulch and everything. And we went down and I checked our restoration and it had been done with cows and it had uh, not really, even, nothing had happened there. The erosion had been no problem whatsoever. So uh, it gets me to wondering, you know, uh, how, why is the forest service, why is the government spending money to do erosion controls like, for instance, this one. This is another one that's um, fairly close to where I live. Uh, actually, I live on a, a, a stream called Dry Creek. This is on a tributary of Dry Creek. Uh, and uh, this is a, a restoration that has been done by the Forest Service. You can see the rolled rolls of straw there. And I don't, uh, actually, I don't know whether they, I don't think they spread any seeds. I think they just put those out. And so, but how well did that work? Well, it doesn't seem like it was all that ambitious a project, but uh, well, with it looks four years later, you would expect something to happen from it. And, and there, four years later, you see what has happened. Uh, not a lot. They've actually put out some other uh, sticks and stuff there uh, to try to help with the erosion. And I, I'm wondering, you know, why, this is an area, incidentally, where grazing had been removed uh, in the mid eighties in order to keep things like the erosion they're trying to fix with the rolls of straw from happening. They said, you know, we'll, the, we'll see it a little bit later on in the show. But it, it, what I started wondering if our erosion, if our seeds, hay and cows work so well down on those other projects that I just showed you, well, why are, what would have happened if we tried them here? So I tried them virtually just to, as an illustration and there, what I think would have happened, not only do I think it would have happened, but we actually did it in places that are almost identical to this. And those are the kind of results that we got. And as the cow tells us up there, a cow commentator, now you know what we can do. And now you see what we can do. So, um, well, you know, the one thing, one of the things we, we, we've talked about this earlier today, and the question was, you know, how can we convince people, how can we get 
constituent, uh, constituency for this sort of effort? What can we do to convince people that, that we should be doing more of it? And one of the things uh, is to get a constituency that's occurred to me, I have friends here around Sedona who are wild horse advocates and think that, you know, there's efforts to get wild horses off places and efforts to keep wild horses in places. And I'm thinking, you know, one of the things that we could do is turn the wild horses into a plus. And we could use wild horses uh, to do, uh, you know, spread some seed and hay out there and use them to add the animal impact and do restorations like this and turn wild horses from an issue into, as this fellow says, a solution. So, uh, but wait a minute, you know, as I said, grazing, as I was saying at that old 6-6 meeting, grazing is supposed to make the land worse. Protection's supposed to heal it. I mean, that's what all these other books were written about, the waste of the West, sacred cows, welfare ranching. On the back of it, it says, you know, your uh, public lands are these guys' feedlot. They're making zillions of dollars off of it. Well, uh, I don't know about zillions, but there's a problem with this whole idea that, that you know, what's the problem? Uh, this land's been protected for 30 plus years. This is not too far from the rules of uh, straw. Is this healthy? Is this a success? Uh, here's a couple other pictures taken in that same vicinity, me and some areas that are obviously eroding pretty quickly. Look at look at the roots hanging down in there. Uh, and, and these are tree, well, you know, tree roots. Do tree roots hold soil? They're not holding this soil. What does hold soil? So uh, here's, uh, Here's an area not too far from where I live that's been protected since 1935. This picture is from the Forest Service. I once measured this. That's a, a friend of mine, Gary, down in the bottom there. And it's essentially, this is three Garys deep and 16 Garys wide, this gully. This is in an area that's been protected as an illustration of how effectively protection actually combats, and I suppose reverses erosion. So uh, well, what, what's going on, you know, is somebody adding this up out there? It's supposedly that, you know, using cows to make things better doesn't add up. Well, let's look at some other scientific studies of all this. This is a, you can see the tape. This is a, uh, an area that has been monitored by the Forest Service to make sure that the fellow here that uh, grazed this a lot allotment wasn't overgrazing it. You can see there's grass pretty much everywhere. It's pretty clipped. Uh, well, you could even probably speculate that it's dead, but, uh, you know, but look at the soil. Soil, well, dead grass generally erodes. This isn't eroding. It's, it's pretty good. The soil's holding pretty well. So let's take a look at this a little later. Here it is uh, in 2016, 30 years. It, it's been protected since the mid 80s, and you can see how well it's withstanding erosion now. And you know, if we're really concerned about ranchers causing erosion, even if you know ranchers who aren't using the savory method or, or however they're doing it, why aren't we so concerned about protection causing erosion? If you want to see what protection can do in the area that you see there in the 1963 photo, let's take a little photo to the a look to the left. Right. I was just down and looked at this area yesterday, and actually it looks significantly worse than this now. That was taken. Well, a year and a half ago, or a year and a quarter ago, and um, it, uh, you know, it's getting worse instead of better. So is this healing? Is this natural? I, it, as I look around, one of the things I use as a study to study this stuff is I go find at the museums that we have around here, old photos of the area. Uh, this is a photo of a ranch that uh, is not too far from here. It's between uh, the town of Sedona where I live in the village of Oak Creek just over the hill is some of the, the, the Sedona monuments there, red rocks in the background. This the cows are on it. This photo was taken in 1957, right around uh, the first of the year. And as you can see, it's, well, it's been grazed since, since uh, as long as anybody at this point could remember because ranchers are some of the first folks that moved here. And uh, there's the cows on it. It's obviously being grazed in 1957, been grazed pretty well. But look, as you can see, there's grass there and not much erosion. So what uh, what happened? The cattle were removed right after that photo was taken, actually, shortly after it. And here's the same area in 2013 after 50 years of protection. You notice the trees are bigger and there's less grass and more bare dirt. And I say more erosion. 
But one of the things is in the 57 photo, you can't see it so well now that that is transposed over the uh, newer photo, as you can see Monument uh, Butte sticking up above that, above the ridge there. Um, well, uh, I, I was wondering, why can't I see it above the ridge now like they could then? Well, one reason I couldn't see it is because uh, 50 plus years of protection, it not only removed the grass, it removed three or four feet of soil. And you could see how the soil, I was standing essentially in the same spot the 57 photo was taken, but I, I was standing three to four feet lower because that much soil had gone in the kind of erosion that you just saw at the other, the 63 photo place. So. Um, well, wait a minute, we're saying that this doesn't add up. Scientists uh, say it doesn't add up. Well, are the scientists actually doing any adding? Are they taking data? Are they taking note of it? Are they recording it? Are, are they uh, comparing it? So uh, let's go to a forestry study area. And one of the things that's studied here is the uh, effectiveness of, of using protection to heal an area that had been grazed really severely Seriously, much it's close to a, a railroad loading yard uh, back uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, this area has been set aside, uh, been protected as a study area, so we could study the effectiveness of protection in uh, about the mid 1940s, 1946 or 7. And so now you're going to be the scientist, you're going to walk onto this uh, protective area and you're going to do some measuring. So let's. Uh, it, there it says, it's created in 46 to study the effectiveness of protecting nature from livestock grazing. And um, there you see, there is one of the study of the, the, the area, which is about the 20, 40 acres, is covered with monitoring sites like this, where stakes are put out and posts and little uh, nails in the ground so you can find the same area again and you can measure between in this case measure between the stakes and count the number of plants that grow there uh, as uh, as protection begins to heal it well this is a there's a site that was made in uh, 1946 and this is what it looks like in 2014 after 68 years of protection uh, are you adding this up Scientists supposedly are. Here's a closer look at uh, some of the other monitoring sites. And like I say, the way to read it is count list the species of plants that have grown here since 1946. You can start doing your uh, adding up right now and counting up. You probably won't use a lot of paper or wear out your pencil doing this. So let's look at some other ones here. Is that other monitoring sites? I was just down and saw this a couple of days ago too. The, it looked actually we had a little more rain in some places this year and they look a little better but not much better than this but there are photos taken in 2016 and if you notice the monitoring sites have been abandoned in other words the scientists aren't adding it up anymore i mean look at the, the abandoned little pieces of uh, wood up there that were all attached to some area so you could measure the distance between and count the plants so uh, well, well, let's let's do some of our own measuring. Uh, what this is the the site. One way we can do this, and as far as I know, there are no monitoring sites where you're going to see. This is just outside one of the fences of you know it's a four sided area. So uh, this would probably be the southeastern fence. Uh, we're, we're going to look at this is the rancher who ranches and is inspired by Savory and and. Uh, uh, tailors his management that he's been a his family actually has been a, a member of six six since its beginning back in the mid 80s actually so uh, we're going to go out and look and see uh, let's see what it looks like just outside that study area there and um, here you go there we just wipe those cows across there and you can see uh, the sign that's on the fence that marks the study area in other words the study area the protected area is right behind that sign and what you're looking at here is uh, the area that is grazed, and these photos were taken on the same day, and you get to compare them. You can add them up. Here there is just a bunch of folks doing some adding. We're actually going to be doing this uh, monitoring again in, a, in about a week. Uh, actually, this weekend coming up. Um, so uh, there it is. You can Now you can count the plants that have grown on the grazed area between the, if you can see off the, the middle photo, the guy that's standing there with the, the Levi's and the green shirt on and bending over, there's a stake to his right. 
and uh, another stake about right at my feet and I took this photo, you can count all the plants that have grown between there and you can compare them to the protected area off to the right. So uh, as I've asked in some of my presentations before, what do you want? Which of these, which one adds up for you? They'd have a rough time adding up all the plants that grow along that one uh, 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 tape because, uh, well, I don't know, how we figure hundreds of thousands, tens at least. And the other one, of course, it's pretty easy to write a zero. So uh, how does the science add up? You've just done your own scientific study. What the, is the results that you've come up with? So uh, let's, you know, well, let's talk about some area, other kinds of areas. Maybe it works, protection works better in other areas like riparian areas where there's a huge effort underway and has been for some time. I was part of that effort too, getting part of this stream, the Verde River declared wild and scenic. Um, about part of it to, to save the riparian areas of the West because they are so valuable that we've got, you know, the cows have a tendency to go there because they can get something to drink, just like bison once did and elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep and all that other stuff. So, uh, but, you know, they're going to overgraze it. This is a picture taken along the Verde River in 1963. In 1997, the mid-90s, uh, a number of environmental groups as part of the effort to save the riparian areas of the Southwest the arid southwest, uh, threatened to sue the Forest Service in order to get the cows off the Verde River in order to save one of the native fishes that uh, rely on these streams, uh, the spike dace, the three-inch minnow. Uh, the Verde was one that had one of the healthier populations of spike dace, uh, the upper Verde especially, uh, at the time. So the, the, the environmental groups threatened to sue the Forest Service. The Forest Service said, well, you know, we'll just agree outside of court in order to, we'll settle out, out of court, uh, we'll get the, we'll tell people to, to get cows off the Forest Service land, the public lands along the Verde, and save the fish for you, uh, the threatened species. So how well did that work? Okay, this photo was taken after eight years, eight years after the cattle had been removed. It's along the Verde River, it's taken downstream a bit from where the previous photo was. And uh, what about the threatened spike? Well, you see what's happened. That doesn't look all that good, does it? The cattle have been removed. It looks like something that some people would say, oh, no, it looks like they've just been added. But they haven't been added. They've been removed. And what's happened to the spike dace? Well, uh, there, I'm going to check. The, the spike dace, that hasn't been one seen in the river since this started happening to it, since they got the cows off and this started to happen. But, you know, maybe it's going to take a little longer for protection to really heal it. Uh, you see, they've got some trees that are bent from the uh, water flow there. But uh, maybe it'll take a little longer for it to heal. So let's look uh, a little more recent. Let's, let's put some more, let's have some more protection. So here's another look at another. This is a little farther downstream uh, again. And this is 11 years after, after 11 years of protection. And, uh, well, how does that, that look? Uh, it hasn't. Actually, just below this, it is eroded as much as the previous photo was. But I just wanted to show this because we've still got soil here. We've still got the river is just off to the right there. You can just barely see the a dent, uh, the, the the river bed that it's in. And but there's no cows here, so this looks like extremely overgrazed land. But it hasn't really been grazed for at least 19 years, and still no spike days. So what do you do? What are we going to do in order? What can we do if we're going to achieve environmentalist goals? Like I still have. I'm still as much of an environmentalist as, uh, as ever. I think I'm more of an environmentalist, more effective an environmentalist because I support something like what you're going to see next. Well, let's see. You're going to one of the things like to say for thousands. Great. This has been grazed as long as there's been large numbers of any kind of animals here, elk, bison or more recently livestock, the latter removed in 97. You saw what happened, as I say here. What if those herds had never left? What if they were returned? Well, can we figure that out? Well, we can go look at a place where the herds didn't leave because there are still being grazed uh, by uh, the, the uh, Geips and Werner family along the river. So uh, let's take a look. Oh, there, that cow is, give us a try. Okay, we'll give you a try. That's what we're going to give them a try. We're going to go look where there are, there are cows where he was. Uh, okay. And uh, she, it. Um, anyway, so here, 
there is an area along the Verde. This photo was taken 13 days after the, the photo that you just saw along the protected area of the Verde. This is an area of the Verde that is grazed and grazed them quite, you know, uh, uh, animals get put in here when they need to put them in here in order to, and, and it is again with the savory intent, uh, the idea of uh, mimicking herds of uh, wild animals, uh, having animal impact. And so uh, there you get to see. So uh, let's do some comparison here. This stretch of the Verde is actually grazed in a manner that mimics the impact of those ancient herds, of the natural herds. And, and uh, here you go. Protected, compare it to protected 19 years, photo taken 13 days before, still no spike days because there's a lot of the river that just doesn't look like this. But the other native fish are doing, and that's noted by fish scientists as well. And and not only are the native fish doing well, but so uh, is is everything else pretty much. So uh, the uh, I'm still adding as to so with all that in mind, and and we as I said, we talked earlier about how do we get a constituency for for this? How do you know? There's there's plenty of constituency out there. I just had a rancher call me today. They're trying to reduce his numbers on a ranch up near Williams, Arizona, north of me, because they want to reduce, they want to, you know, uh, I call it the useless solution. They want to use the land less. Um, so, but with all that in mind that you've just seen, what, what about those cows we have in feedlots? What, you know, what if we use those cattle to restore land that had been damaged in some way, like you've just seen other bunches of cattle restoring land? And, and we're talking again as I, about creating a constituency. What if you could go to the store and buy beef that was from cattle who had been used to recreate this whole synergy between pre, uh, prey, them, predators, us, and the ecosystem? Uh, you could call it a regeneration B after the regeneration uh, uh, pr uh, project of uh, uh, the holistic ma management. So what if they could, could what happened? So let's, uh, you know, here, how would you do it? Well, here, we actually did that. And what we, we took 450 some head, we leased the animals to use to restore this gravel mine from which 13 million tons of uh, gravel had been removed near Flagstaff. Those are the San Francisco peaks in the background there. The gravel was used to build, uh, to rebuild uh, uh, the road between uh, Flagstaff and uh, Page, Arizona, up by Lake Powell, the Colorado River, or the beginning of the Grand Canyon. So what, just think about it. Now, you could go and you could, what if, find out that your, uh, your beef is being produced by this sort of thing. There's Norm again spreading the seeds. This, it had some steep areas in it, so steep that Norm's uh, four-wheeler actually flipped over backwards on him once. But the, uh, the seed uh, spreader there acted as a roll bar. And uh, so he uh, came out of it uh, unscathed, luckily. Um, there in the background there, you can see the a tractor actually we flipped, uh, didn't flip the tractor, flipped the wagon one. Uh, you see it's spreading hay. Uh, and uh, here we go. Then we turn them loose out of the feed lot onto. Uh, are we having a problem? Oh, anyway. So uh, there we're turning them loose. And yeah, I think it's too late already. Are we okay? Anyway, never too late, I suppose. So anyway, there's the photo of the cattle on the side, the the, the steep area where Zorm had flipped and they're eating the hay and they're tromping it in and uh, there they get another picture of it. Uh, as you see, that's a pretty big challenge. Can the cattle handle it? And uh, the response comes from the herd down there, you'll see. So uh, let's, uh, let's see. There is, we have the before and there's the after the regeneration beef. You can see actually we had a performance standard that we had to achieve in order for the mining company to get bond release uh, a release on the bond they had posted uh, in order to be able to mine this, and we actually quadrupled the, the standard. And to boot, one of the Forest Service people that came to confirm that we had achieved our performance standard asked here and said, uh, "What? Uh, why did you use these grasses?" And I said, "Because you told us we had to." And she said, "Well, uh, no, uh, 
No, I, I said, well, a different Forest Service biologist told us we had these. She had, we, we had trouble getting these to grow anywhere, but they grew pretty well here. Still adding, there we go. So let's, uh, and uh, what about, what about global warming? We, have, we haven't really talked about that yet. And uh, so uh, what, what about climate change? The 100, that's, I, that's some of the, uh, the money that I've seen is supposedly, uh, it's going that some people are saying we're going to have to spend in order to uh, avoid climate change, avoid uh, sufficient global warming to actually maybe even end life on Earth. So let's go back to our scientific study plot where there haven't been any cows since 46. I took a surface temperature monitor here and um, went back a little laser thing. You point at and it measured the surface temperature. So I measured the surface temperature of this area, it was uh, 122 degrees. So I went outside and I, oh, here as you recognize the area just outside the fence that is grazed in a, in a functional way and the grazing is functioning. Uh, so on the same day, I took the temperature there and 78 degrees. Now, in spite of this, we see where suppose I've been reading articles in a number of places where Cows are the greatest global warming warmers that exist anywhere. Uh, how do you come up with that out of what we just, and you want to talk about carbon sequestration. How much carbon is being sequestered in those barren areas inside the study plot, in the protected areas, versus how much is here? One of the things we've done, I don't think I included the photo, is take a picture of the carbon that is uh, being uh, essentially pumped into those mine, those white mine tailings by the cows who are regenerating the ecosystem uh, of grassland on top of those mine tailings. So, uh, so are you still adding, or the cows are still adding? And said, uh, so the science doesn't add up. Let's take a look at all this. And uh, let's go back and do our tally sheet. Uh, so we've got those mine tailings and uh, we've got that. So we add that. Now then we have uh, the before at uh, the mine in Nevada. Uh, and uh, here's this, uh, it's just adding up. Uh, then we have the uh, eroded area and uh, we, uh, the, after there, oh, okay. We have uh, the Verde River as protected, no cows there and lots of cows here, the Verde River with cattle along it. Uh, put that on your total sheet there. Then we have the restored, the Forest Service restored area there and we have the uh, restoration using uh, the, the cattle uh, increasing vegetation and uh, remedying other stuff. And then uh, uh, so uh, it doesn't add up. It adds up. It does it add up? It adds up for me. And it adds up enough for me that I, I think it's, it, it, you know. So like I say, how can we, you know, you would think that with environmental issues, it would be unbelievably easy to end up with a constituency for what you've just seen here, for the kind of restoration and the effectiveness of the restoration you've just seen here. But I have taken, we've taken lots of enviros out to, to see these areas and they all know who I am and what I do. I know some of the people who have actually formed some of the more radical environmental groups, well, some of, most of the more radical environmental groups in the country. How much do I hear from them? How much do they say, well, let's talk about this? It, it, what, it, it, uh, it's not gonna be easy. It isn't as easy as you would think that it would be uh, so easy it would be automatic to get people to say, oh yeah, I, it's green, it's better. It's, uh, the fish are still there, I like it. But uh, so what is the challenge? Uh, one thing I think that has to happen is that one rancher I know along uh, the Mexican border in the U.S. was uh, had some uh, one of the uh, uh, more than one environmental group threatened to uh, well they were trying to get him in trouble sue him uh, do so again and get his cows moved off and he sued them that was the lawsuit he sued them for libel because he said that the photos they were using to uh, essentially Bible him to accuse him were uh, were trumped up, were phony, were not accurate, were intended to uh, be not accurate, and he actually won the lawsuit. 
and he won it for a, a quite a quite a ch huge chunk of money. I also know of a another situation. I've talked to these folks up in the north, up in Washington State, where they were um, uh, trying to remove cows from along the river up there, the Colville River, I believe, and uh, because they said that the cattle were causing pollution to the river. Uh, well, the uh, the rancher there hired a, someone to come in and do monitoring on the river, on the preserve, which was upstream, just upstream of him, and on his ranch and downstream of his ranch, where it just the water just flowed off his ranch, and it found out that his ranch, with the cattle on it, was actually acting as a purifier. And you may, uh, some of you may be extremely surprised about that, but I remember that uh, something that happened quite a while ago around San Francisco where there was an effort made to get cattle grazing off of the, some of the San Francisco waterlands, East Bay mud comes to mind and some others. But the, uh, the, the gay community found out that there had been a study done and a certain kind of parasite uh, was more, more common in areas that came in water that came from areas that had not been grazed, that the grazing actually uh, 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 inhibited the, the uh, 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 reproduction and the, the spread, uh, the, the uh, population of those parasites. And so they opposed moving uh, cattle from off of the uh, San Francisco waterlands. So those, those are some ways to create constituencies, but um, it's going to take an effort. It, it's going to take us getting together and one thing, holding environmental groups accountable for the damage that they do, which I don't only know a couple of people have done that, and, uh, and actually uh, uh, doing a better job of marketing what I just called regeneration B, of pointing out that if you really want the, the planet to be healthier, uh, you're probably gonna be a meat eater. I wrote an article once called Eat Meat and Save the Planet. So um, no, that sounds like a good way to, to, uh, to turn it over to questions. Yes. Okay. Are we still there? Yep, we're here. We're here. I just unmuted the participants. Does anyone have any questions for Dan? I can't hear. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I don't think I don't think they're um, either. We don't have audio on them, or um, they don't have questions. So if you do have a question, you can um, type it into the chat window or into the questions window. See one that's come through. Let me see. Yeah, um, so have to yep, I can read them to you. So, so Dan from Tony in Australia, he says, "What sort of quantities and density of feed and animals?" Uh, that's something you have to go to. Uh, you're talking about quantity, how much to feed an animal. I think in the we, uh, restoration work, when you said um, cows, seeds, and hay, who was wondering like what's the the quantity and density oh, yeah. to get the results? Uh, uh, actually, you know, I worked with someone else who came up with. Uh, I probably should be ready to answer that question, but I'm not. And it wasn't all a huge amount, although we did have some places where uh, we put we did some of these projects at times when the drought was the worst it's been. The the, the project, the mines uh, project. Uh, that I showed where we, uh, where I mentioned, you know, putting feedlot cattle out there, we put 400 and some head up by Flagstaff, was in the midst of a huge drought. And uh, they ate a lot of the hay that we put out. But we put out, it, 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 that, I'm, I regret to say I cannot answer that. All right, well, th thank you, Dan. Any other questions? Let's see, you can enter a question or write, write in the chat window. Roland, any questions? Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Oh, that's amazing, because I'm sitting in Mexico uh, at a little place on the Pacific Ocean, and I didn't know if I had good communications. No, one thing I would like to say, Dan, that's absolutely wonderful, and I've been aware of this for so long, having been involved with Ellen right from the beginning, and you know, my my question is, what what? How do you suggest that we get this word spread around to all those that really need to hear it? It's both people who work in government and uh, ranchers and farmers who are still skeptical 
and don't want to do it. I think there's many issues that I can see. Not only do they not want to do it, it's actually very, very difficult logistically to switch over in many cases. So what, what comments have you got on that, Dan? Well, it, it uh, may be, it, it is difficult, not as difficult as some folks think. I think changing the way you do things is difficult for some people because people have a tendency not to want to change. But I, I don't want to put too much of that. I think the thing that we have to do in order to get people to change is the thing that I have been mentioning, and that is build a constituency for it. I just came up recently with this, uh, well, I came up with it a while back, but I just started thinking about pursuing this whole idea of regeneration beef. Of, of, of marketing beef, you know, we're getting, we have a restaurant in Sedona that just changed its menu and I've got to go, it just happened, it's what's well, still happening really. And I got to go talk to the guy, he is selling, he's selling food based on the health of the food for you and the health of the food for the planet. It's being raised in a way that is good for the planet. I think that there is a movement in that direction that we need to be taking more of advantage, advantage of is a bad word to use, but we, we need to be playing ourselves, putting ourselves more into this and going to stores like Whole Foods and stuff that, and, and start actually encouraging ranchers to get into the idea of selling regeneration beef uh, and, be, and showing pictures of the land. Maybe even we could have projects and say, if you buy this beef, it is going to heal this place and we have the way the the, the way you've just seen my uh, presentation here to show people exactly what the food they're eating will achieve i read something recently where a guy says we should be producing meat with soybeans well how much diversity is there in a soybean i mean you know we can go out onto i i, I my wife thought i was totally full of it uh, because, you know, she was a part of the environmental movement as I was until we went and we looked at a ranch up in Utah where she saw more wildlife in one place that she'd never seen anywhere. And she was just absolutely blown away. We saw moose. We saw you, you know, we saw all sorts of birds. At one point I was up there and when it, my, she wasn't there at this time, but where the whole mountainside stood up and started to walk away, it was a herd of deer. But you know, they have a, the, uh, the Deseret Ranch. In, uh, in Utah has been uh, declared one of the best bird watching places in the US uh, <laughs> because they have so much diversity. They have sage grouse there. There are things to market. And I think what we've got to do is instead of, well, we just got to come up with some active marketers who are able to sell what these ranches are producing, who are able to get people to sign on as constituents for what these ranches are and what they produce. It's doable. Well, yeah. It really well, is, but it's going to require a lot of us to get together and start working. You know, that's an incredibly good idea. I think this whole idea of the whole foods thing and grass-fed beef and this, uh, this uh, and the next thing, but people have to see it. There are people who want organic these days, and if they can get a better quality or feel that they're getting a better quality uh, of meat, you know, we just got to show it. We, we, as you're right, I think marketers, marketeers are the guys who can help us. And, and we, we also have the one aspect of that that uh, I mentioned. Uh, this, the other is making uh, environmental groups more accountable. I, I think that there's not a lot of work happening there. Uh, the, the fellow uh, Jim Chilton down in uh, Southern Arizona and some others have been able to do this, but like I, I, I explained this uh, a little earlier today uh, that uh, at one point I was flown out to an island in the uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, an island called Koholawe, because they were trying to reveg it so they could be turned back to the Hawaiian people, and it was almost entirely barren because of the fact it had been used as a gunnery target for 70 some years. Mm -hmm. And they had even tried to reproduce uh, nuclear explosions on this place. So you can imagine oh. what it looked like. Oh, my goodness. It, uh, for the tour, I'm sitting there with a munition, I'm dr driving around with a munitions expert, and he's saying, well, you can walk there, but don't walk there, <laughs> because you might blow up. You know, so, 
And, and when they took us out there, they knew what I did. They knew what I talked about. And I said in the, in, in, well, I think it was either the helicopter or in the airport. I said, well, I'm here for the ride. But I said, you know what I'm going to say. And I'll tell you, frankly, I know what you're going to say. So we came up with a plan to revenge the island. It was turned down. They went to another project, and I just let it go. And then a few years later, I thought, well, I'll see how, how it's doing out there. I'll check on the Koholave project. So I Googled it, and there had just been recently, uh, to my Google, a, um, a, a, an article in a newspaper in Hawaii about how the Koholave project was failing, about how they had spent $51 million on it. And one of the things I did after I uh, went out there is I used some of those photos. And to make my point, I compared photos of that island to photos of Mars, and you couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> so I looked at what it looked like after $51 million, and it still looked like Mars. Wow. Yeah. And they had spent $51 million throwing. One of the things they had done, and it showed it in this newspaper, they had been throwing pallets out of airplanes. So that way you don't have to walk on the place and blow up. But they had, and, and in order to try to get weeds to grow up through the pallets. Mm -hmm. So they had a picture of a pallet with a weed growing through it. And there's your 51 mil. Oh. I, you know, so I looked down the article to see what they suggested to do, what they were going to do, because 51 million, you know, a few weeds growing out of pallets ain't much. <laughs> the, 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 the solution was uh, there were people calling for raising the budget to 1 billion. Oh, no. Oh, man. And how many pallets that would be? <laughs> how, how do you get people to wake up and stop this nonsense? This is what I want to know. It's, 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 it's rough. I mean, I'm just blown away as you are thinking, you know, like, how? Why? Why do you? It, what do you do? I mean, to, to do that. So, and, but, you know, I can go on to... Uh, I can open my newspaper and read something just as foolish just about any time that I want. Well, I'm going to go up and talk to the the uh, Forest Service up around Williams to say, do you, you know, why do you, I'll show you what's going to happen. I could probably even go out and find some places on the ranch and show them exactly what's going to happen if they reduce the, the numbers on that ranch up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the guy is a sensitive We've worked with him. He's worked with 6-6. He knows. He's trying to incorporate some of the savory methods onto this. He called it rotational grazing, but you know, uh, yeah. he's, he's yeah. trying to do a better job and they're trying to shut him down. Dan, I, Dan, I have a question from Tony again in Australia. He says, sounds like you're using animals for a limited time on the restorations. What approach do you have to organizing a lot of animals for a short time? Well, what we did was we leased the animals in one place. Other places, we had a ranch where the animals were already there. But the thing of it is, is uh, uh, I didn't mention it, but a friend of uh, Norm Lowe, and I don't know if Alan talks in these terms or not, he talked about the fact that we, we are doing is we are uh, doing CPR on the land. We're resuscitating the land, which means we are starting, we are restoring a pulse on it. And a pulse is love dove. So you go on, you go off, you go on, you go off. And as Alan saw this over in Africa, I mean, the wildlife, the, the wildebeest come on and they go off. And the land, all living things, if you will, I think, have some sort of a pulse. And so if we're going to do this, we have to have the animals. You have to have a use for the. There's another thing about the, the whole idea that one fellow I know that they're just Wow, I don't know. I haven't gotten ta contact with him. If he's still doing, it. he says, "Well, he says, you know, there's some people who say that once you train your workers, you don't want to eat them." Uh, but without without the pulse, you know, without some without a demand for healthy ecosystems, we're not going to have them. That's one way to put it. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've got to create a demand for real for health that is actual, not just procedural. We have to do. We have to have goals that are descriptive and, and not prescriptive. Prescriptive means if it's managed in a way that is politically correct, according to me, then I am done. And I and if it gets if it looks terrible, like some of these places I've shown you uh, look after they were uh, the, the cattle were removed. I know. Well, it was on the article in Sierra. Well, you just have to rest it longer because they're just recovering from overgrazing. I went out and took a picture. 
Uh, let's see, maybe that's still here. Let me see. There's the picture of my book. And uh, the, the, my book has been republished by the University of Nevada Press, which is kind of, now here's something. It said, well, you know, uh, the lands that are in bad shape, but the, the land that uh, Alan talks about as being uh, overrested and therefore in bad shape are merely t uh, taking a long time to recover from overgrazing. We've been out and I've looked at some of these places and I say it doesn't look like it's recovering to me. And then one of the guys told me, well, maybe it takes more than a lifetime. Well, maybe it is beginning to look like more than several. But so how long does land take to recover from overgrazing? Does this land look overgrazed to you? I mean, someone could go out, if a fellow was looking for pictures of overgrazed land, this is probably a photo that would qualify, right? So notice the date on there. That's November the 22nd, 2016. Now watch the land. Love dub. There it is. It's got a pulse. 428, 2017. That land does that every year. But you remove them and leave them off. And I go on over, I've gone over to the Drake Exclosure, those study areas that I showed you, and I take their picture every year and they don't change. So you could say that, you know, I, I don't think land takes all that long to uh, uh, recover from grazing if it's grazing that is loved of, is a pulse grazing, but uh, it's gonna take more than more than a lot of lifetimes. To re well, you know, some of the land that I've shown you pictures of, that erosion, that ain't never, go we're down to bedrock in some of those areas. That ain't never gonna recover. So I should look at my, uh, uh, my computer instead of my phone, but there you go. So, uh, well. Dad, could I just uh, could I come in with one little thing, one little thing on that? You know what? What is so clear to me is that dealing with this land management, it is never static, and you can never say, "I did it this year, I'm going to do it the same next year." The problem is to teach people to understand that we've got a living thing going here. And sometimes you get less rain, sometimes you get more rain, sometimes you get this and that next day. So you have to know the, uh, the implications of where it's at to be able to manage this. In other words, it needs understanding of the situation to be able to manage, but to understand what you need to do. You see what I'm saying? Oh yeah, and you, that it is absolutely right. We have to have people who are connected to the land, who yeah. can feel its pulse, who are monitoring its pulse. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but that's that's what environmentalists say they want, and so here's an opportunity to do it. Uh, then could we take that 51 million in Hawaii and employ a whole lot of people? And boy, I'd be one that'd love to do this sort of work, except that I'm getting a bit too old, but spend the 51 million on getting people to go around teaching and showing and demonstrating. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Would be wonderful. It is fun. Yes, I love it. <laughs> it I go, I, I do a, 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 a continuing ed classes up here occasionally. I do classes and I had one guy, to, I, I described him. He, he got up and he said, after he saw all the pictures I showed of the really bad stuff, we were just getting around to talking about solutions. and. Uh, he said, well, I know what's going to solve it. He said, crypto, you know, just leaving it alone and the cryptobiotic soils will come on and it'll alter uh, and be. So I said, you're going to be really interested in the next slide. And the next slide I show was a, a picture of a rotting Kaiser roll. But then we looked at a bunch of cryptos. Uh, I showed those pictures too. He jumped up and he said, everything this man has told you is a lie and everything he's going to tell you is a lie and I don't have to stand for it. And he stomped out <laughs> of the class. Okay, let's go look. Let's go look at it. And we went out and looked, and they said, damn, that's the way it looks. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there you go. And we, we saw the, we saw the, you know, the moldy Kaiser rolls out there. I took a, yeah, I took some photos that didn't work out so well. But the, some of the photos, it showed, you know, the, the, the cryptos creating the, the, the cracks, and then the cracks expanding from a couple of inches deep to 12 feet. Um, so Dan, one moment, if I may interrupt, I'm not sure if we still have Tony on from, from, um, 
Australia, he wanted to know, he had a couple of questions. He said that, is it possible to get the use of some of these slides for our local training? Uh, to get what? The slides, your presentation for his local training. He said it was a great presentation. Yeah. Yep. Email dandagat at AOL.com. Okay, D-A-N-D-A-G-G-E-T. Okay, so I'm not sure if you're still there, Tony, but I put um, Dan Daggett's email in our chat window, and then it's also on this recording for others, dandaggett at AOL.com. And then, Dan, would you like to also share your website? Yes, uh, the website is the right way to be green. Uh, you can go and get them there. There are, I just found out that I can put some of these animations. And I'm also going to be working on an iBook so I can have animated photos, and this is inspiring me to work on it harder. Um, I, I love taking photos and working with them this way. It's going to have the animations in the, in the iBook, and you'll be able to look at them that way, too. Wonderful. Wonderful. One thing you Go ahead. Is the, the, one of the places I showed you where I'm holding up my hands and saying, you know, protection doesn't work. The yeah. name of that is, the name of that place is the Canyon of Fools. <laughs> Appropriate. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Well, I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. It's a little bit past the hour, so I think we'll wrap up. Any last thoughts to share with us, Dan? I, I so appreciate your time, and this has been wonderful. Well, just, uh, you know, ah, I don't know. I, I, I'm i looking up at this photo of the uh, – <laughs> this is Black Tank is the name of this place, and I'm going to go out and take a re-photo of it. And it is it's just it's so wonderful to see results like this. I just really hope that uh, that we're all yeah that we have that we figure it out. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone, and thank you Dan again. We'll talk to everyone later. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.